all for joining us. I'm Judith Salter, your librarian and host today, and Peg Brady will be introducing our speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the beginning of a new series on ecosystem-based management and ecosystem-based fisheries management. And I just want to thank the library, Judith, and all the folks here for hosting us uh, and, and conducting this series. I'll be aiming to have a speaker on the second Wednesday of every month, starting this month. Our speaker today is Dr. Karim Aiden, fisheries biologist from our Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And Karim, as you probably have seen, you can see his bio. He's been with the center since his graduate school days in the 90s and was instrumental in presenting the first ecosystem science uh, presentations to the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council in support of their efforts in, in with marine mammal and fisheries interaction. So I want to thank Karen for being our first speaker in the series. And what we'll do is I'll turn it over just to Judith so she can explain the logistics. But there will be an opportunity to ask questions for the folks here in the library as well as folks online. Towards the end, we'll try to answer as many questions as, as we have time. And we will share all of your questions that we've received with Dr. Iden. On our brown bag page, we'll place the recording and any handout. Great. There are a number of folks who asked about who couldn't join us today and wanted to see this presentation. So there'll be opportunities to get that uh, the library uh, website. Yes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen Iden. Thank you. Th thanks very much. Uh, and, and, and thanks for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk here. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the implementation of ecosystem-based fisheries management in Alaska, uh, and particularly the, the federally managed fisheries. And, and what we've done and what our progress has been over the last uh, uh, many years. Um, so the, just to give you a, a little grounding, the, the fisheries in Alaska is one of the most uh, productive fishing areas in the world. Uh, the recent catches, for example, the commercial ground fish, which are the main uh, fisheries we, we work with, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, uh, we had a $2.3 billion wholesale value in 2015, uh, and that represented about 2.2 million uh, metric tons of fish. Uh, of course, we have other fisheries uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, some of the most important include salmon, uh, halibut, and uh, crab. Um, and it's, a, it's just an incredibly rich area and rich, rich fishing ground that's been highly productive for a, a very long time. Um, but it, the region is also uh, very productive ecologically, both sustaining the fishery and a, a wide range of species. Uh, it's one of the um, most active areas of seabird colonies in the world. It has, of course, marine mammals, uh, including northern fur seals, which are pictured here, uh, cetaceans, of course, and as I said, a wide range of seabirds. Uh, so this, of course, uh, like most of the fisheries of the world, is a, is a balancing act between uh, fishing and other eco other uses of, of the habitat. Now, in terms of fisheries management, um, man we're managed by the, the, the ground fish fisheries in particular, which, which is where I'll be focusing most of my time, um, is managed by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, Fishery Management Council. They uh, have a actually have a long history of do performing ecosystem-related management actions. Uh, starting back in the 1980s, uh, when they placed a, a total target cap on ground fish yields, so even if individual quotas are higher, you cannot, from the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, for example, remove more than 2 million metric tons of fish a year. Uh, and if you sum up all of the quotas for individual species uh, in the present day, you do get a higher number than that. So, so this is an ecosystem cap that has uh, an impact. Uh, other examples, uh, there's no target fisheries on many forage species. Um, that includes krill uh, that are pictured here. And there's also a variety of spatial closures. Uh, this, this map on this page just shows a, a, a range of them where trawling and other fishing activities are restricted or, or prohibited at different times of, of the year. And so for quite a large number of years, these uh, a lot of these measures have, have been in place. Um, we also, in Alaska over time, have, um, again, like many regions, have, have had a very active field collection program. 
uh, primarily the Alaska Fishery Science Center, but also universities and other institutions and other uh, agency partners. Um, particularly calling out for oceanography, the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. Um, this, just, this image just shows a range of the different data from lower trophic levels, chlorophyll, uh, to uh, fish surveys, both for ichthyoplankton and large fish, uh, the collection of data such as uh, oceanographic data, acoustic data, uh, all the way up to data on marine food webs from uh, fish food habits, and uh, data for upper trophic levels. So we have a, a long history of, of field collections that are really critical to the, to the work that we, that we do here. Um, we'll lay out a little bit of a timeline of our ecosystem-based management, uh, combining a little bit both what was going on in Alaska and what was on the national level. Uh, in the 1980s, um, while almost all management was single species, the uh, Alaska, as I had mentioned earlier, was proactive in instituting ecosystem measures. Uh, also, in terms of fishery systems, built some of the first broad ecosystem models uh, that in, in some cases led to the uh, calculations that, that, that came up with the 2 million metric ton cap. Um, so there was, there was quite a bit of early work done here. In the 1990s, uh, a lot of the push nationwide was uh, on an academic level to sort of define what ecosystem-based management meant. Um, there were a variety of academic panels and reports to put this together. And at the, at the same time, in Alaska, we developed in the mid-90s uh, what are now called ecosystem status reports nationwide. Uh, ours was, was is called the Ecosystem Considerations uh, in Alaska. So this this was a this now has a, an approximately 20 year history that that started in the 90s. Uh, through the 2000s, there was really a growth of a uh, of a lot of tools. It was it was recognized that uh, we wanted to engage, and these academic reports gave us a good grounding for where we wanted to go. But a lot of the tools just didn't exist, uh, especially models to to, to analyze uh, species interactions and another range of uh, analysis tools that, that weren't available. So while we were trying to engage in ecosystem-based management, this was really a capacity building phase. Uh, and finally, in the recent decade, we've really seen the onset of uh, more formalized programs uh, with the emphasis on saying that we have the tools now and we've, we've developed the abilities and we can actually engage in this management. And to that end, a lot of work has been done laying out what what actually needs to be done in practical terms. This includes uh, developing roadmaps for ecosystem-based management on a national level and, and a local level, uh, and things such as ecosystem, integrated ecosystem assessments that I'll, that I'll talk about a bit more in this talk. Um, this just shows an example of it. This is from the Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management Roadmap developed by Jason Link and others. Uh, this slide, this, this is a slide that's often uh, shown associated with that um, to, to emphasize that, that we're really moving from a single species management realm to over time we've, we've added uh, ecosystem approaches to individual fisheries by including climate and, and other uh, impacts on fisheries up to integrated fisheries management. Uh, and perhaps uh, eventually to ecosystem-based management that balance multiple uses of the ecosystem. Uh, primarily today, I'm going to be talking about EBFM. That's where we're the most actively in engaged in using our ecosystem-based information to better manage fisheries. Now, as I said, this has been going on for some time. And uh, during all this time from the 80s onwards, um, we have used our field data uh, pictured here, um, uh, a couple of different surveys, uh, ichthyoplankton and other surveys in the Gulf of Alaska, um, to, to develop reports. Uh, I'm going to talk about this, this graphic later, that, uh, the, this ecosystem assessment report, that then, that then is delivered to, the, to management bodies. So we, we have done this in a general sense. Um, but when you actually engage in this and say, if you have a piece of ecosystem information that you think is important to management, it's often tricky to figure out how it actually goes into the system. 
And that's where this modern development, this most recent development of uh, procedural methods and best practices has really uh, helped us. Uh, this, for example, in the, is the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council's fisheries management process that occurs on an annual basis. And not only is it on an annual basis, it's on a really compressed schedule where we're in the middle of this now. We, we, don't, we get our field data in September and we have to have quotas in place by the beginning of the year. So the time between September and November is a, a very intense period of uh, developing the survey or developing the stock assessments and going through the review process to an eventual council decision. The schematic shows a bit of it here. And the question really is, in, in this intense process, where, where do you put the ecosystem? Where, where is there time to include that? And this is especially important because as you, as you start to look at the ecosystem, you quickly realize that the ecosystem is a very complex place. Uh, this, this slide uh, simply shows a, a, a static picture of a food web for the Bering Sea showing quite a range of species. Uh, and even so, it's not the full detail that you can show. And you can imagine if you go to a, a, a manager trying to explain all of the interactions in the system and do it in a timely manner in a way that's impactful to management can be a big challenge. And that's especially true because at the end of the day, the, the, the viewpoint of a, a lot of members of the council is, is more on this level. This is actually the, the same food web where we simply look at the, the, the view of maybe a top-down person trying to figure out what they want to get out of the ecosystem. And um, going between these two views in a time-effective manner is e extremely challenging. So one of the ways uh, that I'm going to highlight that, we, that, that, that has come along to do this is called the, the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. The Integrated Ecosystem Assessment is a, is a set of practices developed by, uh, initially by Phil Levin and, uh, and, and others. Uh, to develop um, goals and targets, to develop indicators for reaching those, make ecosystem assessments, do risk assess assessments, and uh, evaluate your management strategies. And this lays out, a, a, again, a, a kind of a map for how we might develop a program um, to do this. So, so what is an, eco an integrated ecosystem assessment? Well, for one thing, in the, if you look in the literature, it's a set of best practices and principles for uh, ecosystem-based management or ecosystem-based fisheries management. So it describes these steps and how you might uh, go about them. Uh, it also sets up a process for delivering advice to management. Uh, it's a product. Um, you, you can say that you've developed a set of products that, that all together, taken all together, develop an integrated ecosystem assessment for the Bering Sea. And of course, nuts and bolts importance. It's also uh, a NOAA program uh, that, that exists for the purpose of promoting and, and funding to, 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 to the best of its ability uh, the delivery of science to management. So really, the, an integrated ecosystem assessment on different levels can be uh, a lot of the, all of the above. Um, and I'm only going to manage to touch on a few aspects of it in this, in this talk. So as a set of best practices, as I said, um, you can, you can uh, go through uh, a, a series of steps and uh, use these to uh, evaluate uh, your ecosystem, where you're going, and where you want to be. Uh, I'm not going to talk through these steps, but, but um, they're laid out carefully. Um, one of, the, one of the aspects of this, though, uh, one of the underlying principles that I'll draw attention to is that um, integrated ecosystem assessments are really place-based. And they, they're going to vary a lot depending on where you are and what's important to you in your ecosystem. Uh, this is important for Alaska because having the largest coastline of any, or ocean area of, um, sorry, well, of, of coastline anyway, of any management region, uh, we are actually have four large marine ecosystems that we look at, the Eastern Bering Sea, the Aleutian Islands, the Gulf of Alaska, and the High Arctic. And so in order to respond to our challenges and structure what we do, we have developed four integrated ecosystem assessment programs within, um, within our region. 
Um, and this is important because the IEAs are place-based, and even within Alaska, um, the important pressures driving the system are different depending on where you are. Um, whether, whether climate change or fishing is the primary driver versus uh, forestry, shipping, and uh, tourism is really dependent on where you are and will really impact your, your, uh, the way you approach management and the way you approach research. So in Alaska, we've developed four separate IEA processes. Um, the advantage to this is, is you can develop uh, different programs that are tailored to stakeholders in the region and can really integrate model and field work that differ from region to regions. Uh, some of the disadvantages, of course, are that some of the large marine ecosystems do uh, get less attention. And when one group is trying to manage a lot of different systems, it, it can become just a logistical challenge. Uh, we've really did, uh, adapted to that by, by phasing these. Um, our integrated ecosystem assessment with, for the Bering Sea, I would consider fairly mature. Uh, we're just spinning up one for the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, the Arctic and the Aleutian Islands are, are perhaps further down the line for, for development. Now, as I said, it's a process, and to, to explain this process, I'm going to use something that some of you might know pretty well, which is the stock assessment process. Um, and, and, to just, and to do this, uh, I'm doing this to show that what we're describing and what's been formalized through this IEA is really nothing different than, than uh, stock assessment managers have been doing for a long time. Um, so in a stock assessment, uh, and this is just for a single species, um, you do set goals and targets. That's the first step in your uh, in this uh, IEA loop. Uh, so, for example, in a stock assessment, it's a maximum sustainable yield or other proxy for a particular stock. Um, the indicators are what you measure. The just the, the biomass of the stock is measured by a, a survey or other indexes like a CPU in, e index that you might use. Your status. Um, Again, following this IEA loop around, uh, you, you monitor with surveys and by coming up with reference points, um, again, rel where are you relative to where you want to be? You conduct the stock assessment to give you the information you need. And then you have some level of uh, strategy evaluation where you conduct adaptive management, where you look at how you're doing and evaluate. So this as a general practice is, is nothing new. We've extended it to the ecosystem in, in developing IEAs, but as a process, it's really something we're, we, we're very familiar with in the fisheries world. And, and this becomes very important when you go back to this slide and ask, how are you going to introduce ecosystem stuff? And the answer is, you can do it at all stages of the process, and that's what we do. We're, um, one of the things that we've done very early on is we're, we've developed a system where we're tightly integrated with the stock assessment. We're tightly integrated with the review process, so there's multiple avenues through which we bring this stuff to the information of the, to the attention of the council or the scientists who are doing the review for the council. And we can, by becoming part of the process rather than finding, trying to find some external box to fit into, uh, we've been able to adapt well and, and um, sort of make the progress that, that, that I'm going to show uh, in the next sort of set of slides. So as I said, the, an IEA can also be seen as a set of products. Um, here's a range of products that, that have been talked about as part of an IEA from planning through modeling to assessment and evaluating where you've gotten. Uh, in this talk, I'm only going to talk about a few very specific examples to give you a flavor for, for what we've done. I'm going to talk about models and our indicator and assessment development. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to touch briefly on the, on the planning that's, that's going on, the long-term planning. Uh, again, I haven't been, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, so this is, this is just a slice. And most of the rest of the focus, um, with the exception of the end, is going to be on what, as I said, was a maturing IEA. And this, so this is all pretty much focused on the Bering Sea. The, 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 the next set of things I'm going to talk about are primarily Bering Sea. 
So I'm going to start with the, with the models, and I'm going to talk about a, a set of models, or uh, if you prefer a modeling suite, uh, that we've developed. It was, it was first initiated uh, as, a, on, as part of a five-year project called the Bering Sea Project with the uh, North Pacific Research Board in partnership with the National Science Foundation. It ran from about uh, 2007 to 2012, approximately. Um, with part of that program, there was an extensive amount of field work, but it also uh, led to a set of models which since 2012 have been adopted as a part of the active, NOAA's active IEA program um, as a partnership between Alaska Fisheries Science Center and the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. Uh, technologically, um, what I'm going to talk about is, this, uh, is, a, is an oceanographic model, a 10-kilometer resolution model of the Bering Sea and regions around it that includes nutrients and plankton dynamics. Um, these models have been around for a long time. Uh, this new one, um, in particular, is adapted to the Bering Sea uh, with significant advances in ice modeling and understanding in both field and modeling of ice plankton and their dynamics. I'm going to talk about several of the products and show how they fed into management. Um, in particular, uh, we've developed a 40-year hindcast of Bering Sea conditions. Um, this slide says 2012, but we are now up to the, up to the present day with nowcasts. Um, we've developed, which I'll talk about, a nine-month forecast looking at future ocean conditions. Um, and then we've developed, a, we've, we've run a range of forecasts using a, a range of uh, global climate models and IPCC scenarios uh, to do long-term forecasts. And these in particular have been used uh, to develop a ra rapid climate assessment to figure out which species are going to be most vulnerable to climate change in the, in the long-term future, uh, and also to determine things like shifting uh, habitat. Um, for, for EFH, essential fish habitat, uh, we've developed projects that use these models to predict uh, how fish will be distributed in the future. Now, one of these reasons these models are so particularly important are the dynamics of the Bering Sea that we've seen over the past, especially the past uh, 20 years since uh, maybe the late 1990s. Um, as part of the Bering Sea program, one of the major uh, synthetic pieces that came out of that was the importance of ice and ice algae in the di annual dynamics of the Bering Sea. Uh, what we're seeing here is model output that's been uh, somewhat corroborated with, with, uh, with data. Um, what we're seeing here is 2004, which was a very warm year in the Bering Sea, and 2008, which was a very uh, cold year. Um, and you can see the, um, the differences in ice and associated ice algae. Uh, the important thing about this algae is that it's a major food source for krill. And what we found is that in these cold, ice-covered conditions, krill flourish. Uh, they do more poorly in warm conditions, and in warm waters, uh, primary production is diverted to uh, smaller things on the food chain, the micro in the microbial loop. And whereas the primary production might be more in a warm year, the actual amount getting to fish seems to be less. Uh, so this schematic is showing um, ba basically that in the warm years, we seem to get skinnier fish that don't grow as well, both juveniles and adults. And in the cold years, we, we do poorly. So this model has, uh, has, has helped us both understand the field work and then further uh, make, make predictions of, of where we're going with this. Now, you'll see I've, I've labeled this thing uh, called the cold pool on here. The, the cold pool uh, is a summer area of bottom cold water that um, is associated with ice melt. So it's smaller in warm years. and uh, bigger in, in large years. It's shown in the dark blue on this figure. And one thing that we've made uh, strides on is being able to actually predict the cold pool to a certain degree of success uh, nine months in advance. So here, what you're seeing is a result. Um, you'll see how this ties into management later, but what this is is a, using a, Climate forecast system, um, seasonal forecast, atmospheric forecasts, 
we, we, we drive this ROMS model, ROMS NPZ model forward, and the red dots you see are for the, for the last uh, five, four years, or five if you include now, uh, we've made predictions for the, for the cold pool um, that so far have been pretty good predictions. Of course, to date, uh, since we started this program, most of our conditions have been very warm. Uh, we've actually predicted a cooling off. The dark red circle here shows that we, for summer 2018, so this is next summer, we're predicting a cooling off uh, of this region of the Bering Sea, so that should be uh, good for fish. Um, and these predictions have shown a really uh, a lot of interest in the fishing community and has al have also helped us target our field collections. For example, it uh, let us predict how far north we would want to go with some of our oceanographic uh, field work in, in 2015. Um, this, pro we've just, uh, th this project has been, uh, again, part of our IEA, project for a f IEA program for a few years. Uh, and we recently received money, money from the NOAA MAP program uh, to do a lot of work validating and improving these forecasts. And so we think this is going to be a very valuable addition. And again, you'll see where that feeds in uh, in a, in, in a few slides of the whole management process. Now we shift to some longer term dynamics. Uh, this shows, uh, based on projections of bottom temperature uh, and, a, and a variety of modeling uh, statistical models, uh, the relationship between essential fish habitat for Pollock as uh, predicted currently and as predicted for the years 2030 to 2040 uh, in this particular case with the CMIP-3 uh, atmospheric model, um, and we've done this with a, we, we have a suite of uh, atmospheric models we've used to, to develop ensemble forecasts. But you can see, for example, uh, for Pollock, we're predicting uh, a bit in increase in fish, essential fish habitat in the north and a bit of decrease in the, in the south, as you might expect from a, from a warming Bering Sea. Uh, but this, again, helps us prioritize and look at which species will be vulnerable uh, to, to shifting habitat. Another way we've used these models is in the development of multi-species stock assessments. Uh, a model, the model developed uh, by Kirsten Holzman and, and others in our program is a multi-species stock assessment model. Uh, currently with three species, uh, we're extending that to, to uh, additional species in the future. Um, but this model, um, it, it basically is, is now part of our uh, stock assessments. Uh, it's used in an advisory capacity, um, not, not to set quotas directly. But in terms of developing long-term predictions and short-term ones, one of the things we've developed is a relationship between these ROMs NPZ model outputs and uh, stock recruitment. Uh, this, this figure shows a set of indices um, from, taken from the ROMS model, um, including fall and spring zooplankton biomass, bottom temperature, and the size of the cold pool. And these have all shown statistically to be predictive um, or to improve our predictive of our stock recruitment relationships. And once we've got this, we can then use this to say both in the long term, uh, again, 30 to 100 years from now, and in the short term uh, on a nine-month framework, um, what recruitment we might expect coming up for the next couple of years. Another way we've used the ROMS model is in the development of uh, spatial process models for fish. Uh, this shows the results of a model we call FEAST, standing for Forage Fousted Abundance in Space and Time. It's a model that, that tracks forage fish and then tracks their predators, uh, particularly the same three species, pollock, cod, and um, arrowtooth. Here you see, uh, in the shaded areas, you see uh, predictions between, again, a cold and a warm year, the 2004-2008. And the, sh the, the shaded area is the model prediction, and the dots are, are field work that, that shows where the, where the a species should be and shouldn't be. Um, or, or sorry, where they were found in the in the sampling, and um, while we while it's not of course a perfect model, it does capture a lot of the onshore offshore 
uh, or on slope off slope dynamics of the Bering Sea, um, particularly when it alternates between warm and cold. Now we're we're extending that and and in a way this ends up feeding back both into the field work into our extension to other trophic levels. One of the things that we're doing with this model is we're we're taking a look at northern fur seals. Northern fur seals um, over the past 20 years have been de declining in the in some of their main populations in the Pribilov Islands. Uh, and so there's concern about their foraging success and their ability to find food in the future. Uh, there have been a lot of tagging of animals. Uh, this figure here, the, the, the individual dots, shows uh, the tagging of uh, animal locations as they forage through the Bering Sea. And the shaded area, again, shows output from, the, from our feast model. That, uh, and there, again, we found some very good correspondence where in years that the um, feast model shows fish in a certain domain uh, of the Bering Sea, the, that's also a time when the fur seals seem to be follow, uh, going to those areas. So again, since these models are, uh, allow us to project into the future, it can, it can, it can help us uh, balance what the needs of the fur seals or the, the status of their population will be. And uh, this thing, this all ends up being integrated because we then turn around and we, we take it back to helping improve our, our field work. Uh, and one of the ways to do this, and I, I, this is just, oh, I think it's so cool. Um, we're developing a system where we, in part, use those models to, to tell us uh, where, we, where we should look for major aggregations of fish. We're, we're following fur seals who, have, who are tagged to tell us a lot about ocean conditions. And we're also developing projects with uh, remote sensing, in particular uh, sail drones that can track over these regions, follow individual animals or follow model areas to help us use all levels of the trophic level from echo sign uh, developed from sail drones to what the first seals are actually seeing to help us uh, co uh, corroborate our models and uh, improve our predictions. And in order to make use of these, um, all, we, we, we end up using, um, we end up with a, a multi-model uh, ensemble, a suite of models. Uh, again, this is a, a project that we've developed in the Bering Sea that's, that basically brings all this together that we've done through the IEA and the past work um, to develop a blended set of predictions for management strategy evaluations. Uh, this is the Alaska Climate or ACLIME project uh, with a range of uh, principal investigators from uh, both the um, oceanography, fisheries, and uh, fisheries economics. Uh, we've developed a set of models, a few of the ones that I've talked about, including Seattle and Feast, uh, some that I haven't talked about, which include uh, climate-enhanced single species models and food web models, such as ECOSIM and, and size spectrum models. And we can use these to develop, along with the, the climate projections I talked about through the ROMS NPZ, to test a range of management strategies and really ask um, what management strategies are going to be resilient and help us reach our goals, uh, our ecosystem management goals in the, in the long term. Um, so we're using these on the background of climate to, to develop uh, resilient management strategies that can that can help us do this work. So that was a, a quick uh, drive-by of uh, of a lot of the modeling, the, the, some of the basic work that that, that goes in. And, and I said this is work that was developed over the last 10 or 15 years. I think the point to highlight with this last slide is these models are really here. They're available. They're ready, and they are being used. Uh, this this project on long-term strategies is in direct work with the council um, and producing a, a long-term outlook look that they're very much looking for. Um, now with that in mind, I'm going to switch to the, switch to the, switch to the short term and, and look at how we're doing there. Um, and, and for this, I'm going to talk about ecosystem indicators and the ecosystem assessments that we produce um, every year for each ecosystem. 
as I said, this was a project that was uh, the ecosystem consideration reports um, or ecosystem status report was um, developed in um, starting in the late 1990s. In the last couple of years, in in conjunction with our IEAs branching out, uh, we've developed it into four com nearly separate, completely separate reports that are produced. Uh, the Eastern Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska are produced annually. Uh, the Aleutian Islands and the Arctic are, are produced a little less regularly, but um, are still updated regularly. Um, and each of these is a very concise and close assessment of, of the ecosystem conditions that's really meant to be directly applicable to management. So these are large marine ecosystem scale assessments very directly targeted for managers, uh, closely linked, as I showed in that process diagram with stock assessments, and they provide context for making ecosystem-based fisheries management decisions. The raw materials for this assessment are, of course, uh, huge amounts of data and model output. Uh, the data is absolutely critical. It, it leverages a lot, uh, the range of all of our field work um, a lot of our very critical field work to keep up over time, um, and it, it covers a wide range of trophic levels from uh, oceanography uh, to climate indices to uh, all the way up through zooplankton, fish, and finally marine mammals, birds, uh, and also uh, human interactions, um, various human and community development uh, indicators. Each year, these are um, reported in a, in a report card format. Uh, this shows uh, a, a report for a, a couple of years ago from the Bering Sea. Uh, the report card is a set of 10 indicators that uh, a group of experts, and we, we reevaluate this every five years, the appropriate indicators. Um, but this is a set to give a snapshot of the ecosystem from the top to the bottom. Uh, and a, a quick set of descriptions that describe what the key things, whether, thing, whether species are going up, going down, and what we should expect. This combines with, for example, the, the multi-species models and projections. Um, and as I said, um, th this particular image shows how we've combined uh, some of the immediate projections and are, com and are putting in that nine-month forecast to drive recruitment uh, predictions, this becomes part of the assessment. Now, as I said, in recent years, we saw warm years uh, uh, shown in the red dots here. You can see those warm years again. And, the, um, and as I said before, because of the absence of ice, that's expected to be poor conditions uh, for fish. This information uh, has, has been presented to the council, and as shown here, uh, in this slide, it actually becomes part of management decisions. So this, these are the minutes from uh, last year, December 2016, uh, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council Scientific Review Panel um, that makes the biological decisions on the maximum uh, allowable catch. Um, and this, this quote from their minutes shows their use, that they said there were several reasons that justify taking a precautionary approach when setting the allowable biological catch of Pollock. Um, our current understanding suggests that survival from age zero to age one might be low due to low availability of prey. Uh, these were some of the indices that were being tracked. And combined with increased predation, um, that's the figure that's shown on this image, showing the increase in predation in the last couple of years of the, of the um, Seattle model, uh, suggests that the 2015 and 2016 year classes were, would be expected to be lower than average. And based on this, they made a more precautionary decision on quota uh, than, the, than the maximum allowed. So this was a case, and uh, this is one example, one of our more recent ones, that, that, that really shows how this information is being directly used in our, in our management process. Now, one of the things is that, that, that you learn as you do this is you really never know where your next issues are coming from. And we really got a lesson in that this year um, by the development of a situation we'd actually been tracking for, for a few years. Um, 
many of you might have heard the story that in the um, in 2015 and 2016 there was a time period that had ex extremely anomalous warm waters in the North Pacific in the in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, this was deemed the blob, so there's uh, quite a few articles out there about the blob and the effects of the warm water. Uh, one of the important things from our point of view is that we were able to almost immediately observe a lot of effects um, by the things we monitored. These included seabird die-offs, uh, poor fish condition, uh, and a variety of other indicators that indicated that, that suggested that this warm water was uh, extremely poor. Of course, we didn't know at the time how this would play out, uh, and you can see here in this graph the, uh, these very warm years of um, the, the last few years of extremely warm water. And we've developed, uh, through our Recruitment Processes Alliance program um, and field work, uh, a set of pretty good relationships, uh, for example, between uh, Pacific cod, uh, or between the temperature that cod experience and their larval abundance. Um, and the re and the result of this really came this year when the surveys came back with the lowest abundance of Pacific cod on, on record. Um, we were able to combine this with modeling uh, to show that the, the effects of increased temperature um, increase the metabolic demand of cod. So we have the highest uh, estimated metabolic demand for cod at the same time that the projected growth went down. And we also saw that in the diets, this is another important piece of data we monitor on a regular basis, we showed a, a, a very large drop between 2013 and 2015 of different types of food in their stomachs, in particular things like capelin, uh, also tanner crabs, which are important food for cod, uh, dropped dramatically in those years. So this is a developing story um, the, this assessment was literally two days ago has been uh, sent out for public, is, has been released for public review. Um, but when we, but the, one of the important things from our point of view, uh, just from the point of view of EBFM, is the fact that we had this information on demand, we're able to bring it to the council to their uh, earlier meeting, their October meeting, and, and, and show them and the fact that we were following the story for uh, since 2015, I feel really, we'll see how this plays out between now and December, but really gave the council, we feel, the tools to make good decisions about how to uh, manage this stock. Now, I'll just finish up by mentioning where we're, where we're going with this. Um, now this, of course, this really is an exercise in, in crisis management when you have a sudden drop um, but again, we've been monitoring the system for um, a couple of years, and we were seeing signs of poor production, so there were ways that we could have developed this earlier, or at least improved our warning signs. And in order to do that, really our next step is to look at much more formal adoption or formalization of these processes. Right now, our system is very adaptable. We're very, as, you, as, as I said, we've been very closely integrated with the management system from bottom to top. This, this, the, the EBFM advice that we provide has many ways of becoming part of the council's decisions. Um, but at the same time, um, if we want to be more precautionary, we're going to have to develop a, a much more stringent set of rules. If we're going to want to recommend to the council that they make adjustments ahead of time. For example, if we wanted to make these recommendations back in 2015 that the COD in two years are going to be in trouble, we have to be very careful about laying out our processes. And that's, what the de and that's one of the things that the development of the fisheries ecosystem plans is meant to lean towards. Uh, currently, we're working on the development of a fisheries ecosystem plan for the Bering Sea. As I said, these are we have different processes for each ecosystem. And the goal of this plan is really to crystallize a lot of this work that we've brought together and in a very formal sense say, yes, we've been doing this for a very large number of years, but here, here is the process. Here's what we've learned. Here's our best practices. And here's how we're going to go forward with this. 
the the FEP is um, is a is a council document that's being developed by a multi-agency team, uh, including the uh, Alaska Fishery Science Center, uh, PMEL, um, Fish and Alaska Fish and Game, uh, Fish and Wildlife, um, and university partners. Um, a lot of what we're really trying to aim for is to develop a very transparent council process for including this ecosystem information and again making these precautionary calls for the council to be able to use this advice. Um, this includes components of outreach. This is meant to be an adaptable, uh, an adaptable ecosystem management plan where you can develop what are called action modules that can inform specific issues. For example, developing an action module on how to, on how to in integrate the long-term climate projections from ACLIME or how to, work, how to bring in essential fish habitat better into this management process. Uh, one of the big focuses of this, both in, our, in describing the ecosystem and how it works and developing our, our outreach, is, is bringing in uh, uh, a focus on local and traditional knowledge in particular, how local communities use conditions, how environments in affect them, for example, how, um, how ice and the quality of the ice determines how far uh, native fishers can go in, in looking for different resources. It's to develop an ecological framework of conceptual models that describe how the Bering Sea work. And, and also very importantly, uh, and maybe this is a bit process heavy, but the importance of a fisheries ecosystem plan is really laying out not just did we plan the right things, but five, ten years from now, did we do the right things? So it has applicable um, elements that are being developed of objectives and goals and research and success tracking. Um, I think this, this is a very interesting development. It's currently in, in active development stage. Uh, for presentation to the council sometime in spring 2018. And that, in a sense, is uh, we've been doing this a long time. Now we're coming back around. We've made the full circle and we're coming back and revisiting our planning. And this will carry us to the next generation of ecosystem based fisheries management. And with that, I'd like to pause and say thank you very much uh, and see if I can take any questions. Thank you, Kerm. William has a question. Could you provide a little more detail on the, the research and success tracking? What are, where are you in that process, and, and what metrics are you using to, uh, to, to put all that together? So this section is very, I would say, active development. So there's a lot of drafting net to do between now and February and March. We've, at this stage, for actual success metrics, that's probably going to be our most challenging thing that we're, and I have to say, stay tuned, unfortunately. What you'll find when you engage in this, I think, is that when you come to your basic objectives and developing ecosystem objectives, we've, we've, we've developed a range of them um, from successful tracking to maintaining populations uh, to preserving food web interactions. Uh, but going back and forth between the council and honing those downs, as you can imagine, is a very active discussion. Uh, we've developed indicator metrics for, for several of these, but what will be in the final choice is is really challenging. For the for the research tracking, I, I think it's a little clearer. Um, one of the places that's going on is through a variety of the documents that um, on the NOAA fishery side. This include the regional EBFM roadmap. Um, this includes uh, our regional climate action plans that I uh, regional action plans for climate that I think most regions are developing. So those are giving us a framework, and, and really the FEP is just creating a, a handshake between the council and these various, like the EBFM roadmap and the um, and these other national planning documents. So basically, is the council handshake to that? Um, that being said, uh, one of the things we're doing in this action module process that I think is a bit new is instead of uh, is we're formalizing the process of, of research prioritization and success and in, in, in that we're saying if there's some piece of research that people think need to be done, who, whether those people are scientists or other people, in order to ensure that it will be used at the council level, 
they develop what's called an action module that goes to a council committee and the council committee says, yes, we think this is important, um, and it's a two-way street. They also they say, yes, we think it's important, we, all, we'll, we agree it's important, and they also say, and when you finish this research, we agree to evaluate it in the following manner, and it could be in, 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 in aim of taking a particular action or other act, uh, or, or it could be an advisement. Uh, but it, it, it sets up this uh, sort of process and handshake so that the research agency knows that the council wants the research and the council is also committed to using the research or at least responding to it when it comes back. Thank you, Karen. We have another question. Thank you for this talk. It's really interesting. I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about how issues related to climate change and ocean acidification are being incorporated into the fisheries ecosystem plan. So, like. Are, are you guys assuming that these impacts of global change are being kind of captured by your rich data sets and, and included in a statistical way? Is the council thinking about uh, changing decision structures to account for um, directional? So it's, it, this is explicitly addressed. As I said, we have this ACLIMB project. Uh, the purpose of the ACLIMB project is to do exactly that, to it's using uh, climate forecasts. So, so with several of the atmospheric models that are also used to do the IPCC forecasts, and for a range of emission scenarios, actually, from pessimistic to optimistic emission scenarios, we have a set of atmospheric models uh, that have predicted various degrees of warning, warming going out to 2100. And these are used to drive that ROMS model I described to predict the oceanography and then that set of fish models I described to, to predict the fishing. And, and those are all calibrated on past uh, events. So yeah, it is calibrated by our past knowledge, but uh, then it goes forward saying, well, if we, you know, we've, we've witnessed the sorts of warm years that we expect in the future, we have, in a lot of cases, witnessed in the past. We just haven't witnessed as many of them, perhaps. So we can use those to calibrate our models and go forward. So, so that allows us to do a biological projections which we have done and we have used. The council, as part of this FEP, has explicitly included an action module that says, we will look at the management strategies that you develop uh, in order to make our fisheries more robust. So they are going to look at recommendations of saying, well, maybe we should calculate our reference points in different ways. Maybe we should, uh, every five years, reevaluate what our climate situation is. There's a range of those on the table. Um, again, we're in the process of what actual management strategies are going to be chosen is still this active research, this project is going on for the next uh, year and it's just been extended with some, with some uh, what are called RTAP funds. Um, so so how, it's, how the council decides what management system they decide on is a very open question, but as part of this FEP they've agreed that they will do this evaluation. That's wonderful. It's really exciting to hear that they're thinking about um, this in the, in the action module. So it sounds to me, if I understand correctly, that the way the system works now is that catch targets and limits are set primarily using single species models that are informed by the ecosystem models and assessments. Do you expect to get to the point eventually where multi-species models or even ecosystem models would be used to set catch targets and limits? We've been talking about that a lot and, and the short answer is, is I don't know. Um, so the way we use it now is as part of our assessment we produce, for those three species I mentioned, we have this three species stock assessment model and we produce the results and those are shown alongside the single species assessment. We've only done this to a couple years and so far, at least in the tactical sense of saying where's our stock, um, they agree pretty well. And so the single species models uh, and the extensive review they've gone through, uh, and Seattle will catch up in that review, but it's still not there yet. Uh, whether, whether there's a, um, efficiencies to be had by switching from one to the other, that's kind of wait and see. Um, you know, and in a way it's, it's very, you're using the, the same people are working on the, on this, or, you know, the same group are, are working on, this, on the same model, so it all becomes blended. I think where it gets the most interesting is, is where the results diverge. 
and so far that that's turned up mainly in um, things like recruitment estimates of uh, how strong a particular year class was. And in cases where that's happened, uh, I think that, that that example I showed of the December 2016 decision where they looked at the results of the Seattle model and said, hey, predation is high. It might be higher than the single species model tells us. The, the mortality might be higher than the single species model tells us. Led them to make that decision. Um, so that I think that's what we're going to use in the near future. Um, whether whether we go to the, the multi-species case, I, I I don't know. And, and again, they're they're very compatible. So so it might if if it's a transition, hopefully it'll be a very smooth one. Uh, the the bigger ecosystem models, I, I I don't see that happening. I I think those are more in an advisory capacity, but it could surprise me. Thank you, Karen. We have a few more questions online. Let's go to Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much, Karen, for that. It's great to see how these ecosystem approaches have advanced since the mid-90s. It's really impressive. Um, my question is really relating to this slide that you're still showing. Um, I'm just curious, it might be a hard question, but how are you planning to integrate the local and traditional knowledge in these action modules? Uh, yeah to the FEP or to the whole process. Right. That, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, we're, we're very early in that, first of all. We set it out as a very general goal when we, when we, when we created our reference, uh, sort of our reference documents for the FEP. So, so a year ago when we started, it was a goal. But it's only been in the last month or so that we've started really talking to some of the sources of uh, some of the community members and sources of the data. Right now, what we see is that it's primarily going to inform our what we call our conceptual model or understanding of how some of these processes work, and especially at the community level. So. Uh, uh, you know, a good example I gave with the ice was we might look at the ice and, and say, well, in the broad ecosystem sense, all we care about was that the Bering Sea was 50% ice covered or 100% ice covered. Uh, but the but the FEP, given that it includes a strong element of human dimensions, if they say, well, on, you know, on a local scale, what really matters is, is if there's ice right here on the port, because um, that makes the biggest difference for us. Uh, using that to sort of drive what, what research and predictive capabilities we might have, or just our understanding of, you know, when we when you look at, say, well, why did fish, uh, an economist might sit in an office and say, well, why did fishers behave that way uh, and try to model it without having that local mo knowledge of people actually knowing why they behave that way, uh, you, you might get a bit off the track. Uh, in terms of direct ecological knowledge, um, there's a lot of facts out there, there uh, uh, a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount of local facts. How we boil it down into a single image for the FEP, uh, and that's a challenging uh, writing exercise, and we're, we're kind of engaged in that now. I enjoyed the talk. I was wondering, I'm a fisheries observer, and I was wondering how does the data collected for, <clears throat> from the fisheries observer uh, fit in with the fisheries ecosystem plan and moving forward? In Assist. Oh, thanks for that question. That that's really huge for us. Um, the in Alaska, almost I, I, about ninety percent of the, our actual field work is summer work. Uh, we only get out there in the summers. That's when we can do our white boat surveys most of the time. There's there's a couple exceptions, but mostly that's it. It's the observers that are going out there in the real conditions and. Um, you know, doing that heavy lifting, and we, so much of the ecosystem-based information that we've collected, um, you know, my, my personal research area in particular uh, is food webs and bioenergetics, uh, which, is, which looks a lot about w at winter survival, how much food do the fish need to survive over winter. And uh, for a number of years, we've, ha uh, we've asked observers to collect uh, fish stomachs uh, and those vary a lot, and, and you can see the difference between warm and cold years, and it's really been uh, just that particular part of our models has been really important. Uh, so 
I don't know that we specifically call it out on a, a broad level, um, but it really has been in, instrumental. And the, the, the folks in the Observer program help us a lot, uh, and the, the collections are just invaluable. Thanks, Karen. This is Peg Brady. I just want to thank you for your efforts. This is a great presentation, great way to uh, start off the series. We're going to do another presentation on December 3rd, and that'll be Chris Kelbel from our AOML lab. And the title of his is Applying our, the IRS Process to Inform EBM in the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll have a chance to take a closer look at another region uh, where a lot of uh, this work is being done. I want to thank you again, Karen. And Simpson, thank you. It was a pleasure. And thank, thank you to all the folks that joined us online and here in the room. Yes, thank you very much.